bulletins. We have a number of announcements to make today. Well, please note that coming up in January, in observance of New Year's Day, the church offices will be closed Monday, January 1st, and there will be no prayer meeting that night. However, the following week will be our annual week of prayer and fasting, and that will be Sunday, January 7th through Saturday, January 13th. And we want to encourage you to come out on those evenings and be a part of corporate prayer and fasting as we pray for God's guidance and God's blessing on us as a church over this coming year and upon his ministry and upon his vision for this island and for southern New England and America and of course the world through our missionaries. Uh, Christmas here at the church today, we will have our candlelight Christmas Eve service at 5 p.m. It will only be about an hour long tonight. Uh, the offices will be closed the 25th through the 27th. So there'll be no Monday night prayer meeting coming up this week and no midweek service as well in observance to Christmas. And we have another announcement in the bulletin, but since the person that this announcement applies to is here with us, we're going to ask Sister Gloria to come on up. We want to welcome her. Back from North Point Bible College, finishing off another semester of study, and uh, we, she is going to be our guest speaker Sunday, January 14th. So, why don't you come on up and greet the church body and share a little bit about what God's been doing in your life? Hey, everyone, it's wonderful to be here. I'm so excited to be here. Here, home with you guys for Christmas. Um, it's been a, an extremely challenging and wonderful semester at North Point, as it always is. Um, God's just working through a lot of things in my life. Um, it's it's just been wonderful experience. I can't even begin to start telling you what all that's been happening. I'm so looking forward to having an opportunity to share a message with you. Um, just this past month, uh, in November, actually, I had the opportunity to preach for the first time at my church uh, in April, and it was wonderful. God did amazing things. So I'm really looking forward to having that opportunity here. Praise the Lord. So with that, let's stand and let's take our Bibles in our hands. Continue our reading in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Romans chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. The Word of God says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive, but if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of sin when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, we, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, 
but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. That we have a new way of living and it is through the strength and the grace and the presence of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. Thank God. What a Christmas gift from God. You know, really, it's fantastic. I mean, can you imagine how life would be if we had to live under the Old Testament law? You know, where you had to have sacrifices every time that something happened in your life that made you unclean. You had to go through a ritual to become clean again. I mean, what a terrible burden that must have been. But we've been set free because of Jesus Christ and his word. Praise God. Let's pray together, church. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you, Lord, for their presence here. I thank you, Lord, for their lives. I thank you, Lord, for their desire to follow you. Lord Jesus, I pray that your hand would be upon them in power today. Father in heaven, I pray that your blessing would be upon this congregation, upon this fellowship, and upon all the churches on this island that are truly preaching you as the way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we ask today for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, that as your presence is here with us, help us to lay aside all of the scheduling and burdens over the next few days that I'm sure we're all thinking about. But Lord, help us at this moment to focus upon you, Lord Jesus, for you are the greatest gift ever given, a gift given from God the Father to us. As your word declares, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. We thank you, Lord Jesus, and we praise your name that you came willingly to live like us, to redeem us by your death, and to seal the everlasting life that you give to us through your resurrection from the dead. Amen. And we pray your blessing upon this service in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord, church. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. I want to encourage you as we celebrate, break the birth of Jesus and go into a new year. I want to encourage you to take the Holy Spirit with you. Invite him in. Take the healing of Jesus with you. Amen. Take the spirit of the living God with you. Hallelujah. Take his peace with you. He said, my peace, I need with you. Amen. The joy of the Lord is our strength. There's so many scriptures that can get you through daily. But just know you can lean on his everlasting love. His love, his peace, it's everlasting, everlasting, hallelujah, hallelujah, our Savior lives. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, dear God. There is none greater, none higher. He reigns in the heavens and in the earth. There is no need to fear because he is with us. Come on, you know the scripture, thy rod and thy staff comfort us. He is the comforter. Amen. Hallelujah. That's something to celebrate now. Come on.
Oh Lord, we worship you today. Oh Lord, we praise you. Jesus, in your life, you did not seek the glory that belongs to you, but instead you gave glory continually to God the Father. And he chose to glorify you. And so it is with us, Lord, that as we humble ourselves in your sight, you promise to lift us up. So, Lord, in worship and in gratitude and thanksgiving for what you've done, Lord Jesus, we choose to humble ourselves before you this morning. We know that we don't need to try and impress you with how we worship. Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We ask, Lord, that this Christmas you would make your presence, your grace, your mercy, your shalom peace, the peace that brings wholeness and health to us, more real to each and every one of us than it has ever been at any time in our walk with you. We thank you, Lord Jesus grace and for your goodness today. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for you. And we give you praise and glory, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 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 We thank you today, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise your name and we glorify you today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brothers and sisters, may you be blessed today by the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated, church. Hallelujah. Beautiful and touching worship. First of all, I want to ask if there's anyone here who is here as a first time visitor. That this is your very first time. We have a hand right there next to Charlotte. We have a hand over here next to Jasmine. God bless you. We have some gifts for you. And so thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Well, it's Christmas. And so we want to give some gifts this morning. 
and we thought it best to recognize a couple of ministries that benefit everyone here in the church that are the invisible ministries. Meaning you see the effect that these ministries do, but you really don't see them happening. I mean, we see the usher ministry, we see the children's ministry, we see the worship ministry, we see the preaching and teaching ministries, we see the prayer ministries, but there are ministries that we don't see. One of the ministries that we'd like to bless today, and uh, my wife's going to come now with the gifts, we want to bless all of those who have volunteered so graciously to help keep this church clean. So we'd like you to come on up. We have gifts for you. And we'd also like to bless all of those who work so hard in the media ministry, making sure that the audio is good, making sure that the video is good, uh, because a major outreach of this church is the fact that we video all of the sermons. And we put them on our YouTube channel, and we link them onto our website. So we'd like you to come on up. We have gifts for you. Don't be shy. Come on up.
few shy ones here. Too. Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, thank you so much for all of these wonderful children. Father, I pray your blessing to be upon them. I pray, Lord, that you would fill them all with the Holy Spirit. Lord, let each and every one of these children understand at the earliest possible age their need to know you as Lord and Savior, and that faith would ignite in their hearts, and that each and every one of these children would grow and become mighty men and women of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a great time. All the kids go out and the floor in here comes up about six inches, right? It's amazing, all these beautiful children. Well, we're continuing our series about that there's more to Christmas. There's more to Christmas than just the Christmas story. There's everything that happened it was going on all of the lessons that God was looking to send to us during and through the events of Christmas. So I'd like today for you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 2, to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. And because of the nature of this message today, we're going to actually read the entire chapter so that you can really see what's happening here and where we're going to be going with this message today. Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. The Bible says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. And they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were under two years of age, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. 
Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who are trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets, that he would be called a Nazarene. The title of the message that I'd like to share with you today from the scriptures we just read is Christmas Prophecies. Christmas Prophecies. Let's pray, church. Father in heaven, Lord, once again, we ask for your blessing to be upon us as we go into the text of your word, into the message that you have sent to us, what you decided through the Holy Spirit to inspire human beings to record about your life and your words. Lord, you sent this as a message to us, to the whole world, Lord, we ask them for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, for the presence of the Holy Spirit, for the blessing of the Holy Spirit to help me to be able to preach your word and to help your people to be able to understand and receive what you want to share to them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, this chapter that we just read, Matthew chapter 2, lists four Old Testament prophecies each one written hundreds of years before Jesus' birth that were all fulfilled at the time of Jesus' birth by Jesus Christ. And there's, it's significant because there's no way that Jesus could have arranged for these prophecies to be fulfilled because he was just a baby at this time. And one of the great hallmarks that show us that the Bible is the inspired word of God is that the Bible is the one book in the world that dares make such specific prophetic predictions of events sometimes hundreds or thousands of years in the future from when they were written and the Bible shows an absolute 100% consistent record of every prophecy being fulfilled. Now, prophecies and predictions are a part of life, from the covers of supermarket tabloids telling you the latest thing that they discovered in the writings of Nostradamus, to business, politics, and religion. It's amazing how many people dare make prophecies and predictions, and it's equally amazing how often they are wrong. Let me give you some examples. In 1903, the president of the Michigan Savings Bank said to Henry Ford's lawyer, quote, the horse is here to stay, but the automobile is only a novelty, a fad. I think he was a little wrong. In 2007, Microsoft CEO Steve Ballmer predicted, quote, there's no chance that the iPhone is going to have a significant market share. No chance. Well, that's not true. In 1932, Albert Einstein said, there's not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. That was Albert Einstein, supposedly one of, one of the smartest men who has ever lived and he got it wrong. In 1962, a Decca Records executive predicted, the Beatles have no future in show business. <laughs> in 2006, Kim Clemen, a now deceased pastor, prophesied that in 2006, both the rapper Eminem and the author Stephen King were going to become Christians and serve God. 
didn't happen. In October 2015, Brian Karn, another pastor, prophesied, quote, Again, I see something happening as we begin to go into a season of smoke and ashes. I see a trump fading out. And I know a lot of preachers just went and had a meeting with Trump. God bless them. But I hope they don't feel like he's going to be president because if they do, they're just wasting their time. Got it completely wrong. Only the Bible gets it right 100% of the time. And we're going to look at four of these prophecies, these Christmas prophecies today from Matthew chapter 2. Let's look at the first one beginning in verse 3 where it says, When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem and Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. I want to share with you this thought from this first prophecy, that God will use our problems and our responses to fulfill his prophecy. And this is something that we don't think about sometimes when God gives a prophetic word, whether it's in scripture or if God has spoken a prophecy or a promise to you personally or to a, us as a church corporately, we often don't think that it's sometimes going to be our problems and our responses to those problems that are the very thing God is going to use as a catalyst to fulfill that prophecy. I think sometimes we get the idea that God gives a prophecy and that somehow, you know, he's just sort of going to magically make it happen. But we have to realize that God works with us in the context of the lives that we live. God gets down with us into the nitty gritty of life that we're living in, our daily routines, and he works through those things to bring about the fulfillment of his promises to us. This prophecy that we just read from Matthew chapter 2, that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, is actually found in Micah chapter 5. And it was written 700 years before Jesus' birth. Now the only way this prophecy could have been fulfilled was for Mary, pregnant with Jesus, to be in Bethlehem when it was time to have birth. But the situation was that Mary and Joseph were living 97 miles to the north in the city, in the little town of Nazareth in the region of Galilee. They were 97 miles away from Bethlehem. But something happened. It says in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, In those days, Caesar Augustus, the Roman emperor, issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. <coughs> So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to, to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. Wow! Mary is pregnant with Jesus, living 97 miles to the north in Nazareth. She needs to be in Bethlehem to give birth to Jesus. Does God show up and say, go to Bethlehem? He doesn't. Instead, God arranges for the pagan Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, to just decide at that time 
to say, well, I want a census of everybody in the entire Roman Empire, and because of the census, you have to go back to the town where you were born. And at that time, Joseph had to take Mary and go back to Bethlehem. But that was a problem for them. They didn't have super highways. They didn't have cars with nice shock absorbers and air conditioning or heated seats. The best they had was a cart or a donkey. And Mary is now late in her third trimester. And now the Roman emperor has decreed, we got to pack up and move 97 miles to the south. And my wife is about ready to pop. This isn't going to be good. This is a problem. And you know, sometimes problems are very inconvenient, aren't they? Problems are always uncomfortable. And problems are always challenging to us. But look at Joseph's response. He doesn't ignore the problem. He doesn't say, well, you know, we'll stay in Nazareth, but we'll hide out in a haystack. So we can bypass the census and you can still give birth here in your hometown. He doesn't run from the problem. He doesn't say, well, we don't want to go to Bethlehem. Let's go to a nice city and give birth there. He doesn't get a bad attitude about the problem. He doesn't walk around, oh, that Roman emperor, those Romans, I hate those Romans. He doesn't do that. And said, Joseph, he accepts the problem and he responds to deal with the problem. And God uses both Joseph's problem and his response. His response was simply, okay, Mary, we're going to Bethlehem. Let's pack up and go. Got to follow the law. We're going to go. And he trusts God with the outcome. Even though his wife is very pregnant at this time, even though walking or riding a donkey or a cart, bouncing along rough roads is probably not the best thing for a woman when you're that pregnant. But he does it. He responds to the problem and the response and as a result, they arrive in Bethlehem just in time for Mary to go into labor, just in time for Jesus to be born in Bethlehem to fulfill a 700-year-old prophecy. Isn't that tremendous? How God works and can work through any problem in our lives and through our responses to them. Let's look at another prophecy Verse 13 says, When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where they stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. The second idea that I want to share with you today is that God uses, in addition to our problems and our responses in fulfilling prophecy, God uses our faith and our obedience to fulfill his prophecy. You see, there are sometimes God will give a promise to a church or a prophetic word or a promise or a prophetic word to you. And that word then becomes contingent upon our faith and our obedience, whether we're going to believe God and obey him. And if we do that, then we're going to see that prophecy or that promise fulfilled. If we don't, we won't. After Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, Joseph was warned by an angel that King Herod would try to kill Jesus. And Joseph was told to take Mary and Jesus and go escape into Egypt because King Herod had no authority in Egypt. He was only king in Judea and Galilee and Samaria. But he had no authority in the Roman province of Egypt. Now, Joseph had an angel speak to him in a, in a dream. And it was literally, get up and go. 
because Herod's going to come and kill this child. There was no time for Joseph to say, well, Lord, I, I think I need some confirmations about this. There was no time for Joseph to say, Mary, did you have a dream? Did, did you have a vision? Did God tell anything to you? No, I was sleeping. I just gave birth. I'm tired. Even God left me alone. Well, there's no confirmation from my wife. I, 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 maybe we should just wait and see. But Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph had to believe. He had to have faith in God that what the angel told him was true. And Joseph had to obey the angel's instruction. Which, by the way, okay, your wife just gave birth. Now she's got a newborn baby that she's got to take care of, and you've got to take care of both of them. Now you've got to go to Egypt. Oh my goodness, more inconveniences, more discomforts, more problems. Oh, and by the way, did we mention that there's a desert in between Bethlehem and Egypt that you have to cross? The Sinai Desert? Oh my goodness. This can't be God. This had, had to be those pancakes I had for breakfast the other day. Why would God, when we just had his child, his son born here, why would God subject us to such inconvenience, to so many discomforts, to so many additional challenges and problems? Well, it's because we sometimes forget that many of the promises of God are conditional upon our faith and upon our obedience to God. Now there are some who teach, oh no, God's promises are never conditional. If that's true, then why does the Bible say things like Psalm 81, verses 13 through 14? It says, if my people would only listen to me, if Israel would only follow my ways, how quickly I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Oh my God, there are two ifs in there. That's conditional. God was saying there, if only Israel would listen to me, if only Israel would follow me, I would take care of their enemies for them. But because they're not listening to me, they're not following me, I'm not going to take care of their enemies for them. Well, pastor, that's Old Testament. Well, let's look at the New Testament. It says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, Jesus himself said, and by the way, you don't get any higher authority than Jesus. Jesus himself said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Uh, that sounds conditional to me. So the question is, when so many of God's promises are conditional upon our faith and our obedience, why do we live like we can do whatever we want, whenever we want, and God is somehow obligated to make it all work out for our benefit anyway? Why do we live like that, even as Christians? Why is it when life doesn't go how we planned, we get angry with God? Psychologist Julie Exline of Case Western University writes, we find that anywhere between one-third and two-thirds of people we've surveyed in the United States admit they sometimes feel angry at God in response to some current thing they are suffering with, such as a cancer diagnosis. Uh, yes, a cancer diagnosis is something that I'm sure none of us plan. I don't think anybody decides, what am I, what am I gonna do in 2018? I know, I'll go get cancer. We don't plan for these things. But these difficulties happen. I don't think Joseph planned for any of this to happen. 
He was a carpenter working in Nazareth. He was engaged to be married to Mary. And then all of a sudden the day comes when his espoused wife, Mary, is, Joseph, I'm pregnant. What? How? Who? What was the Holy Spirit? An angel appeared to me. Yeah, right. I'm sure. Joseph didn't plan that to happen, but an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, don't be afraid to marry Mary, because it's true. What's in her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Joseph marries Mary. Okay, we're going to get married now, and I'll take care of this child, this, the son of God. I'll do it. Oh, here's a decree from Caesar Augustus. You've got to pack up and go to Bethlehem. Oh. I wasn't planning this to happen now. We just decorated the baby's room and now we gotta go to Bethlehem. And then we get to Bethlehem. I need a place to stay. Well, we've got an old barn out back where your wife can give birth. I wasn't planning for this. Well, the baby's born, maybe we'll settle here for a little bit. When a little older, a little stronger, we'll maybe head back to Nazareth. Get up, Joseph. Herod is going to come and kill this baby. Go to Egypt. There's a desert in between here and Egypt. I didn't plan for any of this to happen. Joseph didn't plan for any of this to happen in his life, but his life went as God planned. And I want to share that as an encouragement to many of you who are sitting here today and your hearts and your minds are burdened and heavy because of problems and situations and difficulties and challenges in your life and you're sitting here thinking deep down in your heart, my life is not going, has not been going as, it has, as I planned it to go. I want you to rest assured if you're following God by faith today, your life is going as God planned. He's got you. He's got you. And God used Joseph's faith and obedience to fulfill the prophecy of Hosea chapter 11. Out of Egypt I have called my son. Which, by the way, was written 650 years before Jesus was born. Let's look at another one. Verse 16 says, When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now this is something that's going to be completely counterintuitive to us. Third thought. God uses even our anger and our sins to fulfill his prophecy. Oh my, are you kidding me? No, because it says here that Herod the Great wanted to kill Jesus. But there was a prophecy that was involved about what was going to happen. God used even Herod's anger and sin to fulfill his prophecy. Now, a little background about King Herod the Great. He was an incredibly ungodly king, wicked man. He was brutal. He was ruthless. He was highly intelligent, but he was also completely paranoid. He was so paranoid that people were going to try and take him out and take over his kingdom because his father had been assassinated, that Herod actually executed his wife, Mariamne, who he deeply loved because he thought she was plotting against him. And it's said that for the rest of his life, he would periodically get so upset by the thought that he had her executed, he would wander through his palace shouting her name calling her. Well, Mary Omni wasn't his only wife. He exiled another one, and he divorced another one because he thought they were all plotting against him. Oh, by the way, he had three sons 
He actually had more than that, but his top first three sons, he had them all executed because he believed they were plotting against him. Here we see another Old Testament prophecy, this one from Jeremiah 31, being fulfilled through the anger and sin of an ungodly, wicked, terrible man. Let me give you another time, another prophecy in the Bible when God used anger and sin to fulfill his prophecy. Ezekiel chapter 37 records how the prophet Ezekiel was taken by the Holy Spirit and shown this tremendous vision of a valley full of dry bones scattered everywhere. And God asked Ezekiel, Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel said, God, you know. And God said, Ezekiel, prophesy to these bones. And Ezekiel prophesied to the bones. And Ezekiel heard a rattling. And all of a sudden, all the bones started to come together correctly. And as they came together in complete skeletons, then muscle formed on them and skin and hair. And all of a sudden, there were all these human bodies. But they were still dead. And God asked Ezekiel again to prophesy to the wind, to have the wind come and blow on these bodies. And Ezekiel did, and the wind blew, and the bodies came to life and stood up through this entire valley, and it says it was a great army. And then God told Ezekiel the meaning of the vision. He said, these bones are the house of Israel, dead and scattered among all the nations. But God was giving this prophetic message that the day was going to come when God was going to breathe again on the Jewish people, the descendants of Israel, scattered throughout all the nations, a dead nation, and was going to bring them to life and gather them back into their ancient homeland of Israel. That is an event that has never happened in history at any other time, any other place, to any other people. It's never happened before. Israel became a nation again in 1948. World War II ended in 1945. And we know what happened in World War II. God used the anger and the sins of the Holocaust perpetuated by Nazi Germany in which six million European Jews were systematically dispossessed and murdered to open the door for the return of the Jewish people to Palestine to make their nation of Israel once again. God used the anger and the sins of many to fulfill a tremendous prophecy. A great word of comfort that I enjoy so much in scripture is Psalm 2, verses one through six. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. God is saying there that the nations of the world, the leaders of the world, may be opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. There may be powerful people in this world, wealthy people, influential people, movers and shakers in all of the nations who are opposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But still, God said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God will take even their anger, even their sins, even the persecutions that are given against the church to build his church. It's tremendous. It is tremendous. We're going to hear more about that in our Christmas Eve message that I have for you tonight. It never ceases to amaze me how God can and does use our worst actions as human beings to somehow bring about his best plans. 
Now, that doesn't justify our sins. So please don't go away from here thinking, well, it's okay that I sin because God's going to use it to bring prophecy out. Right. This doesn't justify our sins. What it does is it redeems them. We regret our sins. We repent of our sins. We receive in this life the natural consequences of our sins. But... Somehow, when we repent, when we turn to God, when we receive his gift of forgiveness and mercy and grace, God somehow is able to take our messed up past and use it to reshape our present, to redefine our future. It's tremendous what God can do. And we have to remember that this Christmas. One more prophecy. Let's look at verse 22 of Matthew chapter 2. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Number four. God uses our caution and our decisions to fulfill prophecy, his prophecy. God will even use our caution and our decisions to fulfill his prophecy. Because think about it, when Joseph and Mary and Jesus returned out of Egypt back to the land of Israel, Joseph didn't take them back to Bethlehem. Out of caution, Joseph made the decision to go all the way back, an extra 97 miles, back to Nazareth. And that caution, this decision on Joseph's part, fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah 11, verse 1, which says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Pastor, I didn't see Nazareth in there at all. I didn't see the word Nazarene in there at all. But let me show something to you. It says, a shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Branch is given as a proper name. In the original Hebrew, the word for branch is the word netzar. And it's the same root word that is used in the name of the town Nazareth. So in a sense, the title, Jesus of Nazareth, also can be translated as Jesus the branch. Isn't that tremendous? That's a play on words. He shall be called a Nazarene. He will be called a branch. You see, sometimes we just have to have the faith that our steps, our day-to-day -day mundane decisions, when we make them wisely, biblically and prayerfully are going to be sovereignly guided by God to fulfill his plan and purpose and promises in our church and in our lives. In my own life, I look back over so many decisions that I made for all kinds of mixed reasons, mundane reasons, yet in each God guided the fulfillment of his plan and purpose for my life. I made a decision to go to Zion Bible College. Two reasons. Number one, it was affordable. Number two, they didn't require phys ed. <laughs> hey, that's where I was. That's what I was thinking. When it comes to sports, I'm about as uncoordinated as you can create a human being to be. Where my sons got their ability from 
It's got to be from Liz's genetics because it's not mine, but I'm grateful for that. While at Zion Bible College, I made a decision to work for the president of the college, which was really neat because I learned so much about administration in that position. He offered me, when I was a senior, a position at the college on staff. He offered me that this college would pay for me to get my master's degree so that I could come and teach at the college. I prayed about it and I said, God's called me to be a pastor. And so I made a decision to return to upstate New York and back to live with my parents, sharing the bottom bunk with my youngest brother in the bed up above me, and I wound up working part-time running a cash register at a Kmart. Now that was a decision that didn't make any sense. Because in the human thing, you know, when you, you, you get out of college, you're supposed to go in your career, and then you move up, and you move up in your career. I went about as far backwards as you could get. And at the time, I remember standing there, you know, working the cash register and wondering, dear God, what am I doing? But then I got a call one day saying, oh, there's an Assembly of God church in a city near here that their pastor just resigned and they need somebody to go preach on a Sunday. Are you willing? Sure, I'll go preach. Well, that turned out to be the first step in a pastorate that lasted 15 years. Just a decision like that. Now, while along the way, Liz and her mom made a decision to visit the church. And it was because they were just looking for a church and they were so desperate to look for the church. At the time, they had been raised Baptist and they accepted the advice of another charismatic pastor who didn't say, well, come to my church. He said, go to this church over here. So they came to a Pentecostal church. Well, we got married. <laughs> and while we were planning on getting married, we were planning our honeymoon. And I want to admit to you, I'm going to confess, that first we were planning to go to Prince Edward Island. Because my wife likes Anne of Green Gables. <laughs> but it turned out to be just logistically too far and beyond our budget at the time. So Liz was like, well, we still want to go to, I want to go to an island by the ocean. So we picked Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> Now, our reason for coming here was because we couldn't afford to go to Prince Edward Island. So we came to Martha's Vineyard Island. Not knowing that that little decision all those years ago would lead to pastoring here and living here. See how God just works through the mundane decisions. And sometimes our reasoning and thinking may be a little muddled and goofy when we make our decisions, but God uses our decisions to fulfill his plan and purpose in our lives. You see, this is what Romans 8, 28 is really talking about when it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So with that in mind, God will use your problems and your responses to fulfill his prophecy. God will use your faith and your obedience to fulfill his prophecy. God will use your anger and your sins to fulfill his prophecy. And God will use your caution and your decisions to fulfill his prophecy, his promise, his purpose for your life and for this church on Martha's Vineyard. Let's stand together together, brothers and sisters. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I ask Paris and Ali to return. And I believe that for some of you, this message today has done something encouraging in your hearts. 
And I want to open these altars up for you that if you'd like to come up and have a place of prayer and have some brothers and sisters come and pray with you and agree with you to seal this occasion in the spirit. If you need to make a commitment, God, I am not going to allow myself to be beaten down and discouraged and anxious about how's God going to work this out in my life that I want to invite you up to these altars to pray because God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So these altars are open for you. Uh, please, if you're going to pray for someone, let uh, men pray with men and ladies pray with ladies. And Paris and Allie are going to lead us in song. So the altars are open. around your brothers and sisters up here and to pray with them, for them. 